So, uh, so um, welcome to the report on the uh, 2012 ICFP programming contest. So this year, uh, Kevin Hammond and myself uh, were co-chairing with our team of helpers from Edinburgh and Strathclyde. Now, as you uh, probably know, uh, the programming contest has been held alongside ICFP uh, every year since 1998. And the general idea is we give we give out a problem on Friday, teams have 72 hours, this is the first time they've seen the problem, 72 hours to come up with a solution, and the prize is basically bragging rights. So the winners get bragging rights for their language choice. So various previous tasks have been the uh, uh, ray tracer, Mars rover control, lots, lots of, sort of game playing AI kind of tasks. And uh, so what happened was uh, Peter Thieman, the, the, uh, the general chair, approached uh, Kevin late in uh, 2011. And Kevin said to us as a group, we've been asked to organise the programming contest, uh, what do you think? And I said at that point the stupidest thing I've ever said. I said, ooh, that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we so were doomed at that point. Um, so we did recruit a team of helpers. So uh, in early January and February, I went to a couple of um, uh, meetings in uh, uh, Scottish Programming Language seminar meetings and, and got a team of helpers together. Normally I approached them in the pub afterwards when they were off their guard and they were more likely to say yes. You know, so I, I did spend a lot of money on beer in January. But, anyway. <laughs> uh, we had various meetings in March, uh, plotting some ideas, you know, special secret meetings in the corner of a, a pub in Edinburgh as usual. Um, and we came up with several hundred ideas and ruled them all out because they were either too easy, too hard, too silly, too contrived to a bottle to store, and eventually we thought, well, hang on, we are programming language researchers. What we really want is a programming language theory related to the problem. So, this is what we did. We said, okay, implement a lambda lifter. Now, a room full of functional programmers probably knows what a lambda lifter is. It's something that's been around for a very long time, an important part of lots of uh, functional language implementation. So, I think the first first time the term was coined, as far as I know, was this uh, Thomas Johnson paper from 1985, but uh, I think the idea goes way back to John Hughes in 1982. Is that reasonable? Any, any objections to that? No? Good. Um, so as functional programmers, you all know this. We thought, well, it's only fair, given that it's, this, this contest is open to programmers in any free language, that we explain what lambda lifting is, because, you know, otherwise you've got a head start, and that's good. So this is a lambda, you recognise this, yes? And this is a lambda lifter. Uh, no expense was spent on the artwork. Um, I, I got the finest artist um, in my flat to do this. I asked around for help and everyone said, no, I like your 8-bit style, so... Um, so why do we need lambda lifting? So functional languages are increasingly popular. Um, and <coughs> ideas from functional programming are getting into the mainstream now. Uh, Multicore in particular is, uh, is making lambdas, closures far more relevant. Uh, even C++ has an anonymous function for goodness sake. And I think, as far as I know, the next version of Java uh, is getting some kind of anonymous function notation. So lambdas are being used all over the place. And, and so we have to find some way of you know, extracting lambdas from environments and getting them to the top. Um, so, you'd think this is good news that lambda is being used all over the place. We actually ran some models and we found that if we carry on at the current rate, we're going to run out by the end of October. <laughs> so, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, so, this, this, uh, this uh, scene is uh, these are the Lowland Hills, about uh, 20 miles from St Andrews, maybe about uh, 20 odd miles north of Edinburgh. And uh, we were out walking there in, 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 in March and uh, fell into the lambda mine. We discovered there was a mine and it was full of lambdas. So we thought, if only we could find a way to get the lambdas out of this mine, we'll be fine. So the task, therefore, was to read a description of uh, a mine layout provided by our survey equipment, which we hastily knocked together uh, on uh, one of our uh, Wednesday afternoon meetings in the pub in Edinburgh. And um, given that description, write a plan for a mining robot to get the land without, and then functional programming will be safe uh, for a little bit longer. Uh, we um, also have a, we have an implementation of, uh, of, of a sort of validated thought route. You can get this on uh, Cabal now, so I uploaded it about an hour ago. So if you want to play along with some of the uh, things in this talk, you can type 
Cabal install this, and after you've uh, broke, you know, after you fixed all the, the problems with Cabal and, and worked out which diary you are saying, maybe by maybe by the end of the talk you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll have something. Um, so you can play with that, and um, I'm sure you'll have enormous fun. So um, a mine basically is a two-dimensional uh, grid uh, cells. Uh, each cell can contain one of these things. So the mining robot you've already seen. Uh, there's also some walls. Um, you can find rocks. Rocks are dangerous. Rocks are, rocks are the enemy. Uh, you can be crushed by rocks, but you can also push them out of the way. Lambdas, these are the things you want. Um, every mine has a lambda lift, obviously, because you find a lambda lift. Uh, it begins with a closed lambda lift. Once you've collected all the lambdas, that becomes an open lambda lift, and you can direct the, the, the robot in there. Off you go. Um, you also find earth. You can dig up earth, and you also find some, uh, some empty space. So, uh, this is sounding familiar, by the way. Uh, those of you who grew up in the 1980s, like <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, uh, the mind description that we gave to uh, the end people of this, uh, just two dimensional ASCII, ASCII files. So, we've got a hash here up in the wall, for example, R with the robot, backslashes for lambdas, L for lambda lift, stars for rocks, and so on. Uh, and that all translates to something a bit like this uh, um, when you uh, get the wonderful artwork. Um, and I'll put it together. So, I'll say a little bit, I won't, I won't give you the precise rules because obviously you can go and read that, but just to give you an idea of what uh, people had to contend with, the robot could either move left, right, up, or down, so you can give four instructions, L, R, U, D. Uh, if the robot moves to a cell, well, that cell has to be either empty, it has to contain Earth, so you can dig up Earth, uh, it has to be, uh, or it could be a, an open lambda lift, or if the cell contains a rock, that's okay as long as you can push the rock. So, um, also, you can, uh, you can wait for a step, so you can do nothing, or you can abort your uh, mining operator, you can give up if you think your doodles or a rock is about to land on your robot. So, every step, you move the robot, and then there is a map update. So, in the map update, either a rock, uh, rocks can fall due to gravity, so any rocks that are not supported by anything will drop. And then that leads to a losing condition, so you lose the game if, um, sorry, it's not a game, it's a series, sorry. Um, <laughs> you, you lose uh, if the rock lands on you and crushes the robot. If you've collected all the landers and you've got to the lander lift, oh, sorry, if you've collected all the landers, the uh, closed lander lift becomes an open lander lift and you can move the robot in there. And then the winning condition is basically the robot going into the open lander lift. Uh, I'll give a quick demo actually, because uh, this is the thing that you'll get from, uh, uh, from Hackage. Uh, so, so just to give an idea, of what this is um, this is Gloss, by the way. If anyone needs a simple graphics library for for Haskell, I can heartily recommend Gloss. I've used it for uh, undergraduate projects and all sorts. It's it's it's, it's dead easy. So uh, we have a robot here supporting a, a rock. If I move it to the right, that rock will fall down. If I move it to the right here, that rock falls down. The rocks can also slide off other rocks. So um, here, this we're kind of stopping this rock from falling left. If I move to the left, that rock's going to fall. If I wait a bit, it's going to fall. But you'll note that rocks don't slide to the left off landers, because why would they? Landers are sat to them. <laughs> I got that way, they will fall. So, um, obviously, if I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm dead, because the rocks fall on me. Um, and actually, I, I, was, I was standing and playing this game, it's quite fun, actually. Um, no, let's go on. Um, <laughs> We did find, by the way, that we accidentally created a, a, a genuinely interesting puzzle. We didn't really need to, but people, people had enormous fun when we came not playing the competition because they were having too much fun playing very simulators that people had knocked up. So I don't know if that counts as success. But anyway, uh, so given that example, in part, the sort of output we're looking for here would be just a stream of, um, of, of, of characters, and, and this uh, stream of characters will lead you to uh, the win. So, obviously we have to separate the, the entries somehow, so we have a scoring system. So every, every land that you collect is worth 25 points. Every move you make uh, is, uh, you have one point taken away, so we're, we're uh, emphasising shorter routes, so short path timing is good. Uh, if you have bought, you get 25 bonus points, basically for not dying. Uh, and if you actually get to the end, um, uh, then you get 50 bonus points for every land. So the winning team is going to be the team with the highest aggregate score, over all the maps that we give it. But we thought that was a bit too simple. And besides, we had all kinds of exciting weather conditions, and we thought, well, let's, uh, let's sort of feed these into the, uh, the environment. So we said at the beginning, 
As the main equipment, remember we just did we didn't just knock it up in a pub and end it. So as the main equipment wasn't perfect, and we had to make some refinements over the competition. Um, and after a few hours, we thought, well, we've we've made this a bit better. We'll give people more to deal with. So in the week before the contest, Scotland had some truly rotten weather. Now I know you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> So this, um, it was particularly wrong. Um, this, this is um, Edinburgh Cricket Ground the week before the contest. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the rules of cricket, but it's usually played on the field. <laughs> so, um, obviously, this was good, and it's only 20 miles away from the landmark, so this is going to affect operations. We found some of our mines that were getting flooded. So, uh, we made our robots more waterproof, so this, this line at the end of the input means that the robot is waterproof for 10 steps. Uh, after every, every 10 uh, iterations of the game, the water level will rise, and the initial water level is 2, so that's sort of up to here. So this is uh, this map uh, a few steps in, so the water is already rising here, as you can see. And if you spend too much, too much time on the water, obviously the robot is going to break. Uh, then a bit later, we... Uh, um, actually, this is, uh, this is great, I hope this works. Um, this is, uh, some of you have seen this, haven't you? Um, uh, I don't know if the sound is going to work, but we'll... Uh, I'll do some. <laughs> oh my god! Trumpling! Trumpling! <laughs> Now every time I sit down to code, I shout, trampoline! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, to make things a bit more exciting, because after 26 hours, so there's a lightning division which is finished after 24 hours, so it's much easier for the lightning entrance because they don't have uh, all of these exceptions to deal with. So yeah, 26 hours in, we added trampoline. So trampolines, as any good functional language implement knows, trampoline is getting from one place to another. So um, every trampoline is associated with a target, and that gets you around the uh, mine a bit quicker. But once you've used a trampoline, you can't use it again. So this is a, this is a map with trampolines. Uh, so you see that there's a tra A here indicates a trampoline, and this line at the bottom says it targets point one. So A targets this point, you jump from here to here. And B also targets this point. And once you've used either of these, then they both go away. And we have a trampoline here to get you back. So it looks a bit better if you actually uh, you know, see it. So you do clearly win this game by doing some manoeuvring to you know, get this rock from out of the way of the lift and so on. Now, uh, <clears throat> a bit later, we made our, um, we made our surveying equipment rather more sensitive. Uh, and we found some strange growths on the ground, which were getting in the way. And uh, in honor of the Sig Plan chair, obviously, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the time, you know, we, we, we call this one as beard. Now, every few map updates, as you find in the the beard will grow into each surrounding square. So the question is, what do you do? What do we do to help our robots get rid of Wobbler's beard? Well, you saw this yesterday. We use Hutton's razor. Didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, Phil isn't here, but Graham is. I don't know if uh, later on. We'll know <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I think that's why Phil's not here. Actually, he knew this was coming. <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> so the robot can move around uh, the map, collecting and applying uh, Hutton's razor as necessary. So applying Hutton's razor while standing next to uh, uh, some beers will remove them. Uh, so here we have a map with, um, so these exclamation marks are uh, razors and this W is Walter's beard. And every, every 15 uh, iterations, this beard will grow into the uh, nearest square. So I'll, uh, I do have an example of that. Um, which one is he? Oops. So yeah, this this is this is the map. And so if I, um, I've got to be careful not to be squashed by that rock. So if I uh, move around a bit, eventually that thing is going to grow. And I'm collecting buttons raising now, so I can kill it, and we're fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, just as an aside, I think there's some very interesting questions in my email. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a strange weekend. <laughs> um, right, 
so before I was going, the, the final uh, thing, we found some higher order rocks. So some of the rocks contain lambdas. Um, so if you let those rocks fall, then they turn into lambda, which you can then collect, and you need to collect all of those to get to the uh, lambda list. So that's the basic idea of the, uh, uh, of the contest. Now, uh, obviously we have to score this. So we got a load of, uh, a load of entries, and uh, we have to decide which one is the best. So to decide who was going to win, we took every entry, ran it over um, a collection of maps, and took our official validator. See, the thing you've just seen there, uh, it was also uh, the official validator, so it could read in routes and, and display them. Actually, I'll, uh, while, while, while I'm talking, I'll, I'll set it off on, uh, to my, to my uh, bash uh, history somewhere. Um, yeah, this is the one. So we'll just set, this is the winner on the, on the largest map. So we'll just see how that's going when we get, when we get to the end. It's doing quite well. So. Um, So, um, we ran every entry on a number of maps and we just aggregated the scores. Uh, and we did it in three rounds just to keep a bit of uh, excitement going. So, after a couple of weeks, we announced uh, uh, the, the results of the first set of maps and we, we eliminated the bottom 50, um, making it so it would be easier to run on the, on the next set of larger maps. So, um, the bottom 50 set were eliminated after the sort of qualifying round and we announced the results of that on August 1st. Uh, then in round two, we had some larger maps, so there were more challenges. Some of them uh, you know, ran out of memory rather sooner, and we announced the results of that on uh, August the 9th. And we kept, just to keep things uh, a bit more exciting, in, in case it was too obvious who was going to win, we kept the top 10 scores hidden in, these, in each case. Uh, so we knew that, um, you know, people knew that if, if they were in with a chance of winning, but they didn't necessarily know that they had one. Uh, and then in the end, after all that, we uh, we had we will we will award three prizes. So there was no second place prize this year. So it was a judge's prize, not a discretionary prize. So decided amongst ourselves for well, basically who entertained us the most. Uh, there was a prize for the winner in the lightning division, and there's a, a first place prize. Um, and uh, so the second place, um, uh, there's no extra prize, but they still get some bragging rights. So we'll see uh, later on uh, where that came from. So. Um, the kind of maps we gave uh, in, in uh, the teams to, to, to work with in the end were this sort of thing. So, kind of a lot of lambda in this one, a lambda shaped thing. So, it's quite, this is what I count as a small map. So, this also counts as a small map. This is a few steps in, as, as uh, any alert person will see, I've already screwed this one up because uh, that rock is about to land on this lambda on top of that lift and I won't be able to shift it. But, uh, it was the only way I had to maneuvering the thing to fit in the center of the screen. Um, so this also counts as an easy map, fairly small, few few things. This one also had flooding, by the way, that you can't see here. So this had a combination of all of the, uh, or most of the, the, the extensions. By round two, we had a few harder maps. This one, anyone recognise this? You can tell who this is because of the lambda on the lower part. This is, Kevin spent many happy hours on the Saturday night, <laughs> dividing this one. Um, this is actually unsolved. The best thing about this map, by the way, is no, none of the entries actually solved it. I think it's unsolvable. But the best thing about it, especially given who it's a representation of, is that the highest score was 666. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, there you go. This one, uh, again, a little bit harder. I don't think anybody solved this one. This is just a combination of a lot of the uh, maps that we've already published uh, with the trampoline instead of the lambda lift. So, despite the fact that all the teams could solve them individually, it turned out they couldn't solve them when they were glued together. Uh, probably just because it was very big and, and there was a, lot of, uh, a much larger search space. Uh, round three, we had rather trickier maps. This, is, this one is thanks to uh, Sam Lindley here, who, who worked out that he could uh, convert images to ASCII and then change the characters to be the relevant characters for the game. And so we have a lambda mining around all of Scotland here. And the final one, this really sorted the teams out. <laughs> um, 2012, well, I don't know, can you guess this, who, who this might be? I mean, we've, who? Turing, yes, this is Alan Turing. 2012 being Alan Turing, so Turing, yeah, we thought, you know, as some kind of, I don't know if this is a tribute or anything, you know, <laughs> <laughs> some kind of nods, we would uh, create a map out of this. This one really did sort of tease out, as you can probably imagine. I think it's about 350 uh, by 150, something like that. Right, so, um, on to, on to, uh, yes, 
Um, so we had some difficulty deciding who to get, who we would give the judges' prize to. There, there, there were a lot of fun things, but there, there were a few things that really stood out. So we did enjoy this, this, this fun, I don't know, how do I pronounce that? Just interpretive fun. Um, with their submission, they wrote a story, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, about the adventures of the dwarfs in the Lapamites, which, uh, I don't know if you're willing, I'll publish that. <laughs> yeah. um, a uh, team called Shin H4, who uh, they submitted in the Lightning Division, but they also submitted in the Soul Division. I don't know if you know the language would be fun, but in their readme they said, well, since this is a two-dimensional problem, we thought we'd use a two-dimensional language. <laughs> um, functional in C++ and Unholy Marriage, they did exactly what the name suggests. Their submission was entirely in C++ templates. <laughs> we can't submit a binary because all the computation is done at compile time. <laughs> Language of their own devising, but they also said none of the interesting features have been implemented. And also, two people who didn't enter, but they did make some, they, they had enormous fun making these uh, online implementations of, 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 of the game. And if they'd entered, we might even have uh, considered giving the prize to them. The reason we didn't give the prize to any of these is we felt they were trying too hard to win the judges' prize. <laughs> we wanted it to be a team that had done well, but had sort of incidentally had some fun. And so, for a write-up that we enjoyed, for submitting a roguelike implementation of, of the game into the internet app, I suppose. And I don't know if, I don't know if this has really sent me out a good message, but um, they wrote, we, we like the ICFP contest, we like beer, and catalogued how much they got through. So simply for demonstrating that Haskell is robust as a programming language in the face of excessive alcohol. <laughs> We are giving the prize to Team Edgar Amazon, and Edgar Amazon is an extremely cool bunch of hackers, and we have a representative of this team here. <laughs> In a moment, after I've announced all the prize winners, we'll have a very short presentation from uh, the winners who have been able to come. So if um, You'll, yes, we'll bring you back up in a moment. <laughs> um, so in the Lightning Division, we had uh, 14 maps over three rounds, and the team that won that were way ahead of everyone else. Uh, they scored 147,353 points, which as you can see from the, uh, the scoring system, is quite a lot of points. Um, it's Team Hitori, and that means that Java is very suitable for rapid prototyping. <laughs> They can't make it because of a long-standing commitment, but obviously we all, we all can get the prize to them, and uh, congratulations for that. Right, so an honourable division, uh, as I mentioned in the main division, so again, no prize winner. I don't know if any members of this team are here, uh, this will be a surprise to them because they're not prize winners. But um, they did do extremely well, they didn't do nearly well enough to win, because I said winner was miles ahead. But um, Almost 40,000 points clear of third place is Jabba.ru, uh, which means that OCaml is a fine tool for many applications. <laughs> but, in the first place, we only had 12 maps because we had, as you saw, we had the giant. How many maps do we have? No, we don't still going. Over 12 maps, scoring uh, 30,000. Sorry, okay. <laughs> scoring all those 300,000 points. So miles and miles. Ahead. We knew they were going to win all along. Uh, is the team Frictionless Bananas, which means room full of 300 eminent functional programmers. I announce to you that C++. <laughs> <laughs> So, what I'd like to do now is hand over to the winners, just to have a, a short presentation of how their um, systems work. So, uh, Balash, go ahead. So.
too small. <coughs> okay, so I, I was asked to talk in five minutes about the implementation, so just a very short introduction of the team. So, if you wonder, it means mouse on the Mars in Hungarian. And we were three people <coughs> in a tricky, inhomogeneous environment that we submitted Haskell code, which was 2,000 lines of source. And yeah, we spent a lot of these. <laughs> <coughs> so the strategy was not very clever. We had some simple search algorithms and uh, just try them out in different combinations and uh, choose one according to some heuristics, which were completely ad hoc. So we had like depth first search and more depth first, first search and Dijkstra and some Asta to some target, which a few targets were selected again according to some ad hoc measures. <coughs> Yes, and sometimes we replace the last steps of last time with a small depth first search because maybe that's better. <laughs> so, heuristic wasn't very complicated either, so we gave points for getting numbers, and many points for finishing the map, and minus many points for dying with some smaller adjustment. And <coughs> one more trick was to estimate some the cost of finishing the remaining map, which was kind of some, some of distances from us, the, the number which we have to, yeah, have to be coalesced. But only just nearby, because otherwise it would run out of the time. Okay, so some implementation details. So it was nicely, purely functional, except that the map was stores stored as a mutable array because well, we were promised to be repeat. <coughs> so and it was a singleton copy of this map, which caused some issues when I put the hard time out on the searches, and then it became corrupt. So <coughs> it was not singleton after all. <laughs> and so some little details uh, we were not very unique, I think. So, so I, uh, <coughs> updating the map, we first collected the changes and then executed them together. But that's a I mean, normal way to do it. And all, all every, the differences were stored, so we can undo the changes on, on the mutable array. And uh, we stored all the lambdas and pairs in a set, which again caused some performance issues. But was necessary. Yeah, and we used, <coughs> because of this muted array, it, it led it naturally to continuation passing style. So that's a kind of functional part of the code. And also, we use it best, but only for the interactive part. So it's not used in computing the solution. And there was some optimization because this was very slow. So I and <coughs> profiling said that the most time is spent on querying this set of lambdas. So I tried to optimize that. The first we replaced this set by a, a set of integers, which is faster, has a better implementation. But it was not a big win because converting took up all the wins. So then some special <coughs> tree was used, a two-level structure. First a course map and then smaller set. And I think we cheated a little bit with Asta. <coughs> and then there was some remaining uh, optimization we didn't do because lack of time or lack of ideas. Yeah. We had some graphics. And that's all. <coughs> Functional banana. I like that. Did I say functional? Sorry. Wishful thinking. So I, 
first of all, I just want to say thank you to the organizers for running such a, a great contest. It was a lot of fun. Uh, a little bit about my implementation. Uh, I'll just skip over that first bullet. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, my implementation of the game simulation uh, has a few optimizations that I put in place to efficiently handle large maps. So I keep track of locations where there are currently falling rocks or growing beards to avoid the need to scan the entire map on each update. So in, in the best case where none of those things are happening, the update can be constant time per step. So that helps with time. Uh, as, as far as space, I'm doing a, a search through a large number of states that I need to keep track of simultaneously. Uh, just sorting all those states can take a lot of memory, not to mention time to copy them. So. Uh, I represent states as a diff from previous states, so that way uh, I really only have to store one complete copy of the grid at a time, and whenever I need to work with a certain state, I replay a, a set, of, set of diffs to, to reproduce that state. Uh, of course, that takes some time to, to do as well, so I arrange things so that the diffs can actually, a single diff can replay multiple moves at once, so that if I need to undo or redo, and robot moves, I can do that by applying only uh, login diffs. Of course, this is all very imperative and, and using a lot of mutable states, so that could be interesting to try and work this into a more purely functional world. Uh, as far as the actual strategy, it's basically a form of hill climbing. So the, the program maintains a plan for the robot to execute, and it continually refines it. Uh, Making, make, it makes a random change to the plan, evaluates it to see what score it achieves, if it's better, keeps it, otherwise discards it, and just does that <laughs> until it runs out of time. And the, the key to this working was coming up with a good representation for the plan. Specifically, we need an incremental change to the plan to be able to produce incremental improvements to the resulting solution. So, what I came up with, uh, a plan, consists of a set of positions for the robot to visit. And there's some heuristics of any point earning position, the, the lambda or the open lift at the end of the game is, is by default considered part of the plan, and then other positions can be added explicitly, like telling the robot to go over here and excavate under this rock so that it will fall, things like that. Uh, then to execute the plan and turn it into an actual sequence of moves, it's just a, a greedy strategy, so from a given position I do uh, sort of breadth first search with some pruning of states uh, to find whichever position in the plan that I haven't yet visited that, and that I can reach in the shortest number of steps. So I go there and then do another search from there and so on until I can't reach any more positions in the plan. And that becomes the set of, the set of moves. So one other thing that the plan can store in addition to the set of positions is that there are certain kinds of constraints between like ordering constraints between the positions, so I can say exclude this one position from the plan until I, after I visit this other one, and that sort of thing. So there's uh, plans are mostly unordered, but not entirely, if, if that helps the score. So uh, that's really about it. It's, I know there are certain types of maps where this doesn't work that well on, but I guess it works well on for overall. So. Thank you. Thank you. statistics section, so I'll, I'll just focus on the actually interesting ones. Um, so, we had um, 221 teams uh, submitted something which worked um, in the main contest, and 98 in the lightning. It's always interesting to see what the distribution of languages is, and, and it's hardly surprising that, that C++ win, where the majority, or the, the, the largest number of entries come from C++, there's not actually a proportion, a huge number of functional languages in there. So I just say, functional programmers, have a go. <laughs> um, I've also highlighted some of the more unusual ones. Um, I, I was slightly surprised to see Snowball in there, um, but it was. There's also Pascal, PHP even. Um, Befunge. 
Uh, no actor or Idris. They're not really my space, but uh, maybe, maybe next year. Um, in the main event, uh, sorry, the lightning event, a uh, similar kind of distribution, just, just fewer languages, fewer entries. But again, C is, is the most popular uh, by far. Um, we had 1,139 individual registrations, so we had individual and team registrations. Uh, a lot coming from Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Um, but the geographical distribution basically all over the place, so that was a, uh, nice to see. Why is it so popular in Russia? I'm not so sure, but, but that's great. But, um, so the top, it, it's interesting to look at the, the statistics about the top 10 teams and the language, and this size is actually the team size. So I think this is surprising and, and, and unusual that only two of them have more than one person, and, uh, and, and then there's two people. So the average team size was about two. There were a lot of teams of sort of four or five. But it was only teams of one that played well. I don't know what that says about the teams or the problem or anything. I mean, draw your own conclusions. But I thought that was an interesting uh, little statistic. Also, there's not many functional languages in that in that top ten. Uh, there's OCaml and there's uh, Scala. And I don't know if, I guess we can Scala as a functional language. So. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you want full details of the spec and all the scores and, and you want to play with the simulator, you can go to the website. And I must say, finally, thank you very much to Facebook for their sponsorship who allowed our winners to come over. Uh, okay, thank you very much.